Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Impossible Communities. This is an odd sentence to say. Um, my name is Nava Echelom, and I'm the moderating this panel, and I'm just going to introduce each of our panelists before they speak. And after they talk, we'll, we should have about 45 minutes for Q&A and mm -hmm. conversation among us, kind of synthesize and build on what they offer. Um, so our first panelist is Amaya Gelman, who is a member of Jews Against Israeli Apartheid New York City, and a member in its time of Jews Against the Occupation. She's also a radical urban planner on energy democracy, which she'll be ditching. She'll be ditching that world to do work on Palestine. Um, so the the topic that we sort of started out with when the conference was planned, everybody's changed their topic since then. Um, but initially, our topic was um, trying to look at the issues with doing Palestine solidarity work without claiming um, a, a, like a geopolitical or religious invested identity. So not as Jews or Israelis or Arabs, Palestinians, Muslims, whatever. Um, and part of the reason for that is that um, is the context that we work in in New York, which is super Jewy, um, just because of the the way that Palestine activism has sort of developed over the last ten years, maybe longer. A very like a lot of Jewish organizations and Jewish specific Palestine organizing, and I myself have probably not uttered a sentence in the last ten years since so I began as a Jew. Um, so that was the the context that. Um, that Queers Against Israeli Apartheid, New York City, started organizing in, um, and it seemed worth looking at that a little bit more closely. What the topic has become, since we, have, we did a series of interviews, sort of, we were trying to like crowdsource the answers to this question, um, but as often happens when one or two people are co-leading the interviews, other stuff comes out that is of interest to them, and then the topic turns. So, um, so we depart a little bit from that. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on why in New York City, since they said I was going to do that, and then, um, and then I'm going to tell you more about the interviews. And I'm actually going to read that part because I just want to be careful. Um, so the background on Quiet is, as I said, there was a lot of um, a lot of Jewish focused anti organizing, anti occupation organizing, starting at the um, the beginning of the Second Intifada, and as it turns out. Um, a significant portion of proportion of those organizers were queer, and so a lot of the organizing was like also queer and touched by queer stuff. And there were also um, there was a strain of um, queer organizers in in the rest of the Palestine solidarity world, and then uh, actually Queers Against Israeli Apartheid formed in response to. Um, to a ban by the New York City LGBT Center on any discussion of Palestine. We can talk about Israel, but not Palestine. Um, and, and that brought out a stream of activists who had been involved in queer politics, but not in anti-occupation politics in any way. So we have these sort of three threads of activism um, that came together in Queers Against Israeli Apartheid. Um, and we stayed, so Queers Against Israeli Apartheid formed like two and a half years ago. Um, and the reason it's called Queers Against Israeli Apartheid is not because we wanted to be the people in Toronto, although we respect them a lot, and now we know them a lot. Um, but because the center had specifically banned the, or specifically like cited a problem with the use of the word apartheid as like too controversial or too political. It was like the magic bullet that you know made things bad. Um, so, and they also said that anti-apartheid organizing wasn't queer. So obviously we had to be called Queers Against Israeli Apartheid. <laughs> and, um, and now we're Queers Against Israeli Apartheid in New York City because there are actually three quiets around the world, at least. Um, so because of the focus on, because of the LGBT center as sort of like the uh, like magnet for all of this stuff, um, our work has focused a lot on the sort of war between progressive queers and conservative gay institutions. And the center is one, and the center's board is like made up of, you know, bankers and um, people like, you know, in the sort of super fancy arts world and stuff, um, as is the case with many gay organizations now. And, uh, and our, we have gay electeds who are also sort of, you know, claim a left progressive identity, but it's because they're queer, but in fact are not particularly progressive. And so we've done a lot of work um, challenging that stuff. Um, and without going into the details, we won the repeal of the ban um, in February. I think. Uh, it was a sort of partial victory. The center did not really change. They just lifted the ban. Um, 
Um, we brought discussion of Palestinian human rights into the queer community, and probably in the course of doing that, debunked like probably just the most superficial um, racist and Islamophobic myth that people have used to, used to demonize Palestine. I don't know if we made like super deep inroads into people's understanding of Palestine, but um, but some. And uh, although, as I said, I don't think we've made any good progress on the queer institutions, we've now opened up some space that, that we can use to organize to push forward. So that's Quaya. Um, I'll also just say, because it's of interest, I think, like, uh, I think that about somewhere between a third to a half of Quaya is Jewish. Um, it's almost entirely white. And I'm the youngest person in Quaya, and I'm 38. So it's, I don't know, it's a thing. <laughs> uh, it's a factor in many things. I mean, it's also a factor in the um, in the fact that uh, Quaya has never like Quaya has a set of um, activists who have really different politics, and we don't necessarily all agree with each other. We've, we've come from different movements, different times, um, and we have never really had a huge amount of conversation about why we're doing what we're doing or what's critical about it. Um, and so, part of the reason that we were interested in doing this interview project was to try and get at some of the things that we don't discuss, to try and you know get ourselves on record about stuff. So. Um, this the framework for this conversation, um, the, you know, the idea of doing anti-occupation work not from a sort of like a recognizable stakeholder identity is that criticism of Israel and support for Palestinian human rights sort of begins with the question: Are you being anti-Semitic? Like, you, you know, before you even open your mouth, you have to, like, pin the sign on yourself that says that you're not being a Semitic. And for that reason, uh, activism often highlights Jewish and Palestinian voices in the course of the work. And to be honest, Palestinian voices are, like, a little bit far and few between in some cases, so it turns out to be Jewish voices. Um, and, you know, acknowledging the importance of highlighting Palestinian voices as a way of being accountable to the set of folks who are, um, who are experiencing occupation and apartheid um, I think it, it's worth challenging a little bit the extent to which we highlight Jewish voices um, because uh, it contributes, I think, to the, to the environment in which you have to have an invested identity in order to be a legitimate speaker. And that was actually something that came out of this set of interviews. Um, so I'll just read you a little bit, sorry. Um, the, there, so there's Jewish and there's Palestinian and you know all the sort of related identities and everybody understands why they're speaking, and then there's other people who speak from other identities and that there's always the question of like why are these people concerned about Palestine? You know what is what's your investment here? Um, and the uh, one of the things that queer activism does is it gives people sort of a platform. You know, be starting a sentence as a queer sort of immediately gives a lens. Um, a sort of parody platform in the same way as, you know, citing um, an, an, a, like relationship to another national, you know, liberation movement, so I, um, creates some, a platform for speaking. Um, uh, and so in the course of our work, um, claiming queer identity has been important, but also it turns out that everybody, well, I'll read to you a little bit from the interviews, but. Um, but our assertion that we don't claim a stakeholder identity sort of washed away when we started talking to people about why do you do this work without claiming such and such an identity. It almost immediately went from, you know, I don't claim, an, uh, I don't claim a stakeholder identity to, well, I'm a U.S. taxpayer or, well, I, you know, I'm a person of color and I understand from this perspective. So not claiming um, a personal identity as a platform from, from which to do this work was really hard for people. Um, so I'm just going to read to you a little bit from the from the interview um, right up. Um, and I don't know how much time do I have. I don't want to over five minutes. OK. I'm going to review quickly. Um, so just the series of questions asked queer activists to identify what's important about organizing without claiming one of those identities, and what identities they use or submerge instead. And part of this was to get at the question of some unresolved tensions between queers and Muslim organizations. And you know sometimes those tensions are emergent and sometimes they're not. Um, the, the sort of extent of it in New York is that we have been trying to put together a panel of um, queers against Israeli apartheid and Muslim organizations to talk about overlaps and we just can't get anybody interested. You know, so it's not like we're not fighting each other or anything, but there's some tensions there that are probably worth noticing. Um, and to get at some of those tensions, um, we asked one thing we asked was how activist work touches on anti-Islamophobia work, and we also asked people the old chestnut, what do you think of Hamas? 
and what people are really asking when they challenge queer Palestine activists with that question. And there's nobody who didn't laugh, so <laughs> carry on laughing. Um, so the, the main points that came out were these. Um, first of all, everybody agreed that it's really important for non-stakeholder identities to be public voices on Palestine in order to define it as a human rights issue. Um, that, um, that it was really important to take away this frame of Jews versus Palestinians or Israelis versus Palestinians. The reasons that people wanted to speak out as queers were completely divergent. In fact, I think conflicting. Um, some of the reasons included, you know, like people wanted to fight the neoliberalization of queers in the US and Canada. Um, they wanted to push the anti-apartheid movement to be more queer. Or the most contentious answer was that they wanted to use queers' presence in the anti-apartheid movement to make queers more visible in the Palestinian public. Um, and we don't have to fight about that here, but it's worth noting that um, that's not resolved. The question of whether, like, who we're acting on, including are we trying to change Palestinians? Um, and then the last, the Hamas question um, created a whole other set of, um, of answers, which I'll, I'll go into, I think, at the end. Um, but the, the sort of upshot of it was that queer Palestine solidarity activists are very sensitive to the idea of being outsiders to Palestine. So to whatever extent we've set up, there's Jews and there's Palestinians and everybody else is just sort of looking through the windows. That's really working to, um, to make people feel like they don't have ownership of this question. Uh, and I'll just like, you know, conditionalize that by saying that everybody I think is also really, um, everybody that we interviewed was really cautious about not wanting to steal or claim Palestinian voices, and that's part of what went into not wanting to make pass a judgment on Hamas, but, but there were sort of subtle differences in who was willing and who was not willing to do that. Um, so the other thing I'll add is that after we did the interviews, mostly afterwards, uh, for two days this week there was a Queer Visions gathering, which was an extension of the uh, World Social Forum, Free Palestine, whatever, Palestine Solidarity moment. Um, and in those conversations, queer activists noted that the anti-pinkwashing movement, um, particularly, I think, in the, in the West, I don't know, um, is overwhelmingly white and that it's focused on Israel and Palestine without broadly adopting um, any kind of analysis of settler um, colonialism. And that may apply more to the U.S. than to Canada. Um, so the, the big takeaway here... Maybe yeah, I don't have time to get to the Hamas thing, but maybe it's not that important. The big takeaway here was, um, was the importance of queer voices as having the power to build a human rights framework for Palestine solidarity activism in a way that, um, first of all, recognizing that in spite of the fact that it's really important for Jews to, challenge that, uh, Jews to challenge Israel, that having that be the framework for the entire conversation actually prevents people from reading it as a human rights issue. And so instead of being able to come to it and say like, hey, this is sort of like a, a clear you know, issue that anybody can get involved in, that everybody has to find the, an appropriate identity to, to do it. And if they can't, then they're out. And the real um, crystallizing moment for that was when the number of people who described their experience working in South African anti-apartheid and Central American solidarity movements. And I'll just read you this one quote from an interview, which this is from Kate Raphael from Quit in the Bay Area. So we need to break down this idea that this is some age-old conflict between Arabs and Jews. It's everyone's issue, just like you didn't have to be Central American to care about Central America. Um, and most of us who worked on liberation for South Africa were not South African. We'd never been there. We didn't know anyone from there. We weren't doing it because we had a personal relationship. We were doing it because it was a human rights issue. And that's exactly what Palestine is, and everyone needs that, to take that responsibility. Um, and so I would, without you know, going into the, all my great arguments, which you can read sometime. Um, I guess I would just contend that um, queer activism has the capacity to pull Palestine back into that arena um, because, partly because of this weird position that queers hold right now where like anything that a queer utters is you know, ostensibly about human rights. So HRC has been able to claim that turf for marriage. You know, it doesn't matter how left or progressive the issue is. Like, if it's a queer issue, it can be tagged with human rights. So if, we, if queers do that consciously, and if we, speaking for myself personally, break the addiction to starting every sentence with as a Jew or as a queer Jew or whatever, um, then we can take back some of that turf. And I will just say that um, in the end of my discussion of the Hamas question, I thought that was one of the solutions to, um, to the problem that people feel so removed from the situation that they can't really make a coherent answer if you decide you want to answer the question to what do queers think about Hamas. Thank you.
next speaker is Yael Mishali, um, who did her PhD at Tel Aviv University about the crisis of a separation between feminism and queer theory, exemplified through butch femme culture. Now she's doing a postdoc in the South of Israel about Arab Jewish queers. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to add some complexity to the dichotomy Israelis, Palestinians, by talking about different activist groups and minorities in Israel through rage politics and my criticism of it regarding uh, the Israeli space. I'm an uh, Arab Jewish Mizrahi queer, and I'm just going to read it then afterwards. You, everybody knows what Mizrahi and Ashkenazi means? Okay, so Mizrahi means like um, Arab Jews who immigrated to Israel, to Israel from Arab and Muslim countries. And Ashkenazi means uh, Jews who immigrated from Europe and the States. Uh, and that, that dichotomy is very much like black and white in the States uh, for like the social uh, relations between those groups. Um, very, uh, very much similar. <coughs> I am not who I seem to be. Under a black and white gaze, I have been identified most of my life as Ashkenazi and straight, something which pays my everyday life with rage. In a heterosexist, racist, rape culture, almost every time I turn on my computer or step, or step out to the street, I am the rage of all women condensed to the explosion, as American lesbians stated in the 70s. When I just started my journey as an academic and activist, minorities' reclaiming of rage as means of resistance gave me strength and hope. Audrey Lowe's understanding of rage as women's reaction to racism, as well as a legacy endowed from a mother to a daughter, allowed me to rewrite my own childhood charging my mother's rage for everything which was taken away from her with feminist rebellion. The moment I became Mizrahi feminist was the moment I stopped being angry at my mother and redirected my anger at the institutions that oppressed her and taught her how to oppress me. I am all for minorities' head count, but I never know what box my presence is going to help check. When exclusion is divided into separate groups, who am I? the lesbian, the Mizrahi, the feminist, the queer, the femme, the academic, the Ashkenazi wannabe. In March 2012, uh, Bet Berg College, which is an Israeli uh, college, planned at the annual conference in memory of Vicky Shiran, a Mizrahi feminist academic and activist who played a key, a key role in the fight for the, advance, for the advancement of Mizrahis and in promoting a Palestinian-Israeli dialogue. With the release of the conference's program, a highly charged discussion burst in the virtual space around the issue of representation. A few Mizrahi women activists personally attacked the organizer for not including enough Palestinian and Mizrahi speakers and for neglecting Vicky Shiran's vision by doing so. In response, the organizer, who is both the head of the gender studies program in Litvill and a Mizrahi woman herself, initiated a meeting which resulted in the invitation of more Palestinian and Mizrahi women to participate in the conference, including Hanin Zouabi, the first Arab Israeli woman to be elected to the Israeli legislative body. However, Zouabi's invitation was almost immediately revoked by the college's management. This discourse was undoubtedly fueled with rage, but was, but was this rage to rephrase Ben Hooks a healing source of love and strength, or a catalyst for productive change. This discussion, both, this discussion both confirmed and reproduced a set of dichotomies that often serve the hegemonic discourse in defining social hierarchies. While it was grounded in a binary between Ashkenazi and Mizrahi, it was actually led by two Mizrahi women who are not estranged to academia. Clearly, the core representation of minorities had to be addressed. However, what are the implications of identifying this exclusion primarily with a Mizrahi woman? And how was this utilized to push aside the key role played by the occupying Israeli Ashkenazi white institution? In this discussion, and many like it, every Mizrahi woman was given the opportunity to inhibit one of either poles, 
the authentic Mizrahi from the hood, or the fake Mizrahi from academia, forced to actively erase any parts of herself that transgress to the other side. But when we accuse some Mizrahi women to be not real, aren't we upholding a normalizing mechanism which defines realness only in terms of maleness and whiteness? When we charge Mizrahis with Ashkenazi behavior, aren't we actually admitting that there are qualities solely in the possession of Ashkenazis? What is the Mizrahi performance that we, Mizrahi feminist activists, consider authentic, and to what extent it exceeds the stereotypes we are working to dismantle? Am I Mizrahi enough when I'm spending Shabbat dinner with my religious parents or depositing my minimum, my minimum wage from academia? And what about when I'm in class teaching a queer theory course in Tel Aviv University? Who am I in writing this paper? As a Moroccan, I always felt on both sides, black in my eyes and white in my skin. I have never believed that under my white mask, given at birth, I have pure blackness waiting to explode upon the surface. What kind of determinist homogeneity do we attribute to Mizrahi when we position it in opposition to Ashkenazi? <coughs> and doesn't this ally a critical characteristic of the hybrid Arab-Jewish identity which resides, as Ella Shochat explains, on an intersection of two poles and therefore necessarily consists of both the oppressor and the oppressed? During the discussion, the conference's organizer published a personal note in which she acknowledged that, in spite of her intentions and efforts, there was a problem with the representation of minorities in the conference. But she also rejected the aggressive nature of the criticism. This post also stirred a lot of condemnation and was read as an attempt to shift the discussion from the political issue at hand to the personal insult of a privileged person. Most comments dealt with the justified rage of the excluded groups, while denying the organizers' feelings, viewing them as irrelevant to a political discussion. How can we explain the dismantle of intentions and feelings in the face of the affirmation of rage, not only as a legitimate reaction, but also as a means of resistance of the marginalized? Isn't rage a feeling? As Sarah Ahmed explains, the depersonalizing of justice can make injuries disappear and protect those who harm others. The victim, don't take it personally, fails because it allows the harmful action to be justified through the concealment of its effects, which are effects on somebody. Why does, activist group, why does the, the activist discourse in Israel redefine rage as political and productive while leaving all other feelings to symbolize the shirking of responsibility, dealing with nonsense, or failing to control embarrassing outbursts? Haven't feelings always served to negate the validity of some arguments, mainly of women and other minorities? Is our struggle against racism and sexism limited to becoming the stereotype itself? to becoming rage? Could a discourse that neglects feelings by judging them as irrelevant to social change <coughs> avoid perpetuating white male rationalism? Is the acceptance of the Mizrahi rage inevitably free of racism? Can't we trace it back to a racist understanding of both Mizrahis and Palestinians as those who can communicate only through rage or violence? If our reclaiming of rage as a political tool relies on the axiom the personal is political, how can we explain the removal of the emotional from the person? The black and lesbian feminists who initially signified rage as a form of resistance believed in women's commitment to each other and viewed compassion or erotic interest as a viable means of sisterhood. Perhaps considering the feelings and intentions of allies is what solidarity is all about even if it's not postmodern or fashionable within academia for a few decades. Yet, there is no point in being nostalgic. The raging feminist text also encouraged separatism and framed sexual difference in terms of biology. As a result, not everybody was invited to join the solidarity clique. How far removed are contemporary activist groups in Israel from this limiting model? Is there a group ready to acknowledge more than one oppression at a time? Don't they all accept and exclude based on bodily attributes? What kind of activism can be produced between the poles 
Arab Jewish, Mizrahi Ashkenazi, feminist, queer, transgender, cisgender, and should there be a middle ground? Who is fighting for an unemployed Ashkenazi trans man who does not pass as male? An Israeli cisgender woman who works on the street? A Palestinian woman who is a lesbian? Is it the same kind of rage when directed at the Israeli occupation, Ashkenazi hegemony, rape culture, or the only ones ready to account for it? Rage can make it easier to forget that different oppressions coexist and harder to remember that in the argument, who is more oppressed, we all, we all lose each other. Even if in more Western places, rage can subvert white male heteronormative decrees, in Israel, rage serves to deliver social norms and function as one of the master's tools. Conceptualizing rage as a rebellious tactic in the Israeli sphere obscures its role in enforcing national, ethnic, gender, and sexual orders. This could be easily demonstrated by the concealment, the consistent violent rage of soldiers toward Palestinians and of policemen against all ethnic and racial minorities in Israel, while nonviolent rage of protesters and activists gains extensive coverage. Rage can also operate as a regulating dis discursive mechanism utilized to shift and neutralize any public discussion. Rage about the exclusion of women in the ultra-Orthodox society served to, to construct a fictitious gender equality in the, sexual, in the secu secular sphere. Rage about the objection to hold the Pride Parade in West Jerusalem served to hide homophobia in and outside of Tel Aviv. The collective rage about the murder of gay teens in a local LGBT youth center served to fabricate a love story between the public and queer people which worked to expunge not only years of homophobia, but also the fact that the murderer is still free. Rage politics might not, be, might not only alienate us from allies, but even reposition us on the other side of the fence. Instead of exposing the reciprocal relations between national and sexual occupations in Israel, leftist rage is used to justify the ongoing cooperation with sexually violent leftist intellectuals and to silence privileged Israeli women who are coerced to avoid implicating the oppressed activists. What does rage push us, sorry, when does rage push, push us to resist injustice? And when does it blind us to oppression other than the one or on our current agenda? I'm finishing. However hopeful, Foucault's claim that where there is power, there is resistance, can serve as a reminder that any form of disobedience is at the same time a product of, a product of the power it is set to challenge. The double and unstable nature of power can explain why rage, raised in the face of social injustices, is eventually utilized to divert struggles, to, di to divide and conquer, to promote essentialism disguised as authenticity, to turn agendas against themselves, to replace institutions with individuals, and to reduce political, political complexity to, to, to the rhetorical question, who is against who? Foucault defines power not in terms of restricting or forbidding, but in terms of producing relations. What kind of relations are created and broken in the name of rage in the activist space in Israel? As Sela Ahmed points out, emotions can serve to secure social hierarchies, but can also open up futures in the ways they involve different orientations to others. If indeed the emotional struggles against injustice offer different kinds of attachments to others, maybe the smallest minority in Israel, the activist, should bridge between different points of view and resistance, since in the words of Foucault, it is precisely the strategic codification of these points of resistance that make a revolution possible. Um, our next speaker is Carmen Chavez, who is an assistant professor of communication arts and Chicano, Chicana, and Latino, uh, Latino, Latina studies at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Her book. Queer Migration Politics will be out with University of Illinois Press later this year. And Amy Brenzel is not here, but um, I assume you're, you're collaborating in your yeah. project. 
I'll just say a word about your co-author, um, who's an assistant professor of American Studies and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of New Mexico, and is finishing her book, tentatively titled The Kansas City. Thanks. Thanks all for uh, being here. And Amy, sorry she can't be here, but she likes to leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> take all the slack myself. So um, th this paper, I guess, is a bit of a meditation, maybe a bit of a polemic, um, something that Branzell and I have been talking about for a lot of years, um, and some students uh, that we work with, like Rachel Levitt, have been talking about for a lot of years. And so um, it's kind of offered in that spirit as opposed to kind of an academic paper, although maybe it's theoretical, I'm not sure. Um, so. Uh, in terrorist assemblages, Poirot advises moving from intersectionality to Deleuze and Guattari's notion of the assemblage with the key of queerness. Mm -hmm. Though later revising or at least clarifying her thesis in a 2012 essay, given the popularity of terrorist assemblages and the relative obscurity of a journal like Philosophia, we believe that despite the clarifications provided, some of the worries that we have had remain. Uh, to briefly recap Poirot's argument, as we read it in an, an assemblage, is a conglomeration of multiplicities, a series of dispersed but mutually implicated messy networks that draws together enunciation and dissolution, ca causality and effect, effect, organic and non-organic forces. In this way, the assemblage accounts for other contingencies of belonging that the identity politics framework, which is allegedly upheld through intersectionality, may not account for. The assemblage emphasizes movement, flow, and affectivities. Drawing on Brian Sumi, who maintains the notion of positionality, suggests a positioning on a grid. Poir contends that intersectionality is a hermeneutic of positionality that seeks to account for locality, specificity, placement, junctions. As a supposed theory of identity, subjectivity, and positionality, and one that emerges from within a disciplinary society, Intersectionality, in Poir's view, lacks the capacity to account for the complexity of power in control societies. Therefore, queerness should be thought of as assemblage as opposed to identity or even anti-identity, which again, in her view, appear to be the options provided from within intersectionality, which is a perspective obsessed with the will to know the truth. Now, the assemblage is a useful concept. It has, however, always been unclear to us why intersectionality is that which Poirot attempts to define against in a move to the assemblage, um, even as she's sort of suggesting a tension between them. It seems to us that Poirot's definition of intersectionality may be premised on a misreading of both Kimberly Crenshaw's initial conceptualizations as well as subsequent iterations, and further, that the binary opposition staged between intersectionality and the assemblage may be premised on a misunderstanding of the status and project of intersectionality. This brief presentation will work through each of these arguments and then suggest some implications for homonationalism, namely that the dichotomies that undergird it, um, intersectionality versus assemblage and the white homonationalist versus the brown queer Muslim terrorist, may enable the erasure of anti-racist critique and actually supplement empire building projects. Now, there's no doubt that there are important critiques to be made of intersectionality, which scholars like uh, woman of color feminist Maria Lugones have aptly noted. Uh, but for the sake of brevity, we maintain that rather than being a theory of identity and subjectivity that assumes that aspects of identity are separable or that identities and subjectivities are essential statuses of being, intersectionality is a theory of power and subjection that helps to understand how institutions operate through oppressive logics. Such logics, as scholars like Shireen Razak have illustrated, show the complex and unpredictable ways that institutions subject people with various possibilities and impossibilities for their exclusion and inclusion. It's a brief review when US third world feminists begin to theorize the multiple displacements that shaped US women of color lives and identities. These feminists of color, working class feminists and lesbians articulated the interlocking nature as well as the double or multiple jeopardy of being subjected by multiple interlocking systems of oppression. And from writings and speeches like these, Kimberly Crenshaw derived a theory she named intersectionality. Crenshaw's famous 1991 essay describes how the experiences of women of color, poor, and immigrant women are subsumed in a race and state and other institutional contexts. This erasure occurs because within the context of her illustrative case studies, all women are assumed to be white and all blacks are assumed to be men within arenas such as law, politics, and media representation. An inability to think outside of singular modes of power has detrimental effects for women of color, among others. As scholars are increasingly indicating, 
Despite early assumptions about the, the waning of the significance of the nation state and globalization, states, especially hegemonic states, are becoming increasingly nimble. Hegemonic states are shifting their processes of domination, discipline, and control to adjust to the demands of desiring global capital and achieving or maintaining political sovereignty. And for this reason, continuing to understand state level and institutional processes of subjection are essential. Intersectionality reveals when people and things get stopped up, excluded, detained, cast out, processes not so easily accounted for by the assemblage. Now, returning to one of Crenshaw's original examples, when institutions focus only on a single axis of power, such as, say, sexism, when constructing policies and offering services designed to help, say, rape survivors, those institutions ignore the resources that may not be available to women of color due to racism, classism, cultural literacy, among other things. All women, as some men, can become victims of rape, so it might seem as if any policy or service provision designed to help women as a general category should be sufficient. However, systems of race, gender, and class interact to construe different experiences for different women. White middle class women are more likely to be financially secure than working class women of color. White middle class women rarely are oppressed because of their race. Thus, their needs after a rape may be very different when compared to working class women of color who may have needs that extend beyond recovering from the violent act. Now, if institutions, uh, to further um, just outline her example, if institutions are equipped only to help white middle class women recover from a rape and do not account for the other social and economic conditions that may be present for poor women and women of color, this institution effectively favors the needs of wider middle class women. It's kind of a, hopefully a familiar argument. Uh, this is one way in which power works, and this is the sort of logic that intersectionality highlights. The operations of power might be, in certain instances, predictable. But by and large, intersectionality does not aim to produce truth with regard to identity or power, nor does it reduce power to positions on a grid. So it seems to us that suggesting these things, these are the things that intersectionality accomplishes is in fact a false premise. Second, to position intersectionality in the way Pouar does assumes that intersectionality has achieved such a status within queer and feminist studies that it needs to be that which one defines their own approach against. Such an assumption is both itself a politics of positioning and also a misunderstanding of intersectionality within queer and even feminist studies. Undoubtedly, as Sirma Bilge argues, intersectionality has become a very popular topic of discussion among feminist scholars, in particular with uh, numerous collections, conferences, book series, and debates in European and North American contexts. Explosion in amount of scholarship does not necessarily mean that there has been an equal explosion in the serious engagement or quality of that scholarship. Much of that work is played with problems such as processes that Bilge names like the whitening of intersectionality and the depoliticization of intersectionality through excessive meta-theoretical musings. Bilge laments, disciplinary feminists, be they white or of color, should stop doing intersectionality in ways that undo it. One of them is by turning intersectionality into an over-academic exercise of speculative or normative musings. Crenshaw underscores this concern, noting that she has learned more from what activists have done with intersectionality than from what others have speculated about its appeal. And fortunately, we worry that Poir's discussion of intersectionality succumbs to this critique. Outside of the allegations of male philosophers trained in European traditions, we find that in terrorist assemblages, intersectionality is set up as a straw person that's easy to tear down. So what is the point of this negation of intersectionality, and further, what are the implications? Bilge and Sarah Ahmed help to answer this question in a general way. Bilge notes, we need to remember that the same tool, intersectionality, does not serve the same purpose at different hands, and that the use of intersectionality by a woman scholar of color to challenge the racial blindness in a research unit, which privileges, let's say, a class-first or gender-first approach, is not the same with the use of intersectionality by a white woman scholar to criticize a race-first approach let's say, a conference on racism, but raising the question, yes, but what about dot, 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 and point towards the missing items on the intersectional shopping list. One has to wonder if in the suggestion that intersectionality does not account for affect and mobility, is Poirot's critique functioning similarly, perhaps even more sobering as what Ackman suggests, which is that, quote, when hearing about race and racism is too difficult, intersectionality can be deployed as a defense, a defense against hearing. Does Poir's critique enable such an unhearing? It's not that Poir's doing the unhearing, but does the critique enable the unhearing? Uh, 
Such questions also have implications for our thinking about homonationalism. Homonationalism is evidenced by this conference and dozens of recent publications that make use of it as a theoretical apparatus has, like related concepts of gay imperialism, become a very significant part of thinking on sexual nationalisms, queer liberalism, and empire. Indeed, like women of color, transnational, and third world feminists who long critiqued the use of feminism and women's rights for similar nation and empire building ends, homonationalism illuminates an important process or series of processes with which Western gay and queer people might be unknowingly complicit or knowingly. The need to actively work against these processes is a crucial intervention into queer studies as well as queer and LGBT politics. Despite the import and impact of homonationalism as a critical intervention, the erasure and negation of intersectionality that animates Poirot's argument is cause for pause. If homonationalism and an analysis of it emerge only or primarily through negating intersectionality, and if political and legal processes of the state also negate the possibility of intersectional understanding, it seems that rather than simply offering a critique of the nation state's empire building, homonationalist critiques are also complicit in such empire building. Furthermore, it seems to us that given the status of theory about the political and the ongoing aggressiveness of those in the so-called post-political camp who continue to negate the value of identity, homonationalism might become an easy foil to further enable the recentering of whiteness at the expense of much needed anti-racist critiques. Perhaps one way to see this by briefly noting what C. Riley Snorton suggests in his forthcoming book, No One Is Supposed to Know, uh, where he says the production of the queer terrorist, or of, I'm sorry, the terrorist itself within the analysis of homonationalism is also premised upon the specter of the abjected black queer who also threatens the nation, yet there's little place in theorizing of homonationalism to map that complexity. The erasure of the labor of women of color and analysis of state-based and institutional oppression for the sake of centering an abstracted affect seems to offer little political possibility, the exact kind of political possibility that intersectionality was designed to enable in the first place. So we ask, what would analysis of homonationalism look like if animated from within the tension or what um, she later calls the frictional relationship between intersectionality and the assemblage, um, Puar suggests. As she writes in her 2012 piece, so one of the big paths for thinking through the intertwined relations of intersectionality and assemblages is that it can help us produce more roadmaps of precisely these not quite fully understood relations between discipline and control. Um, and we welcome more uh, of this type of thinking. Our next talk is by Masha Adabuch, who is a graduate student at Hebrew University, um, where she studies cultural studies and gender, and works in the Akhoti, right? Mm -hmm. uh, movement on feminism of color in the Israeli context. Um, and Masha is also accompanied um, <laughs> by Yossi David, who's a graduate student in political communication and gender at Hebrew University. And Yossi's research is about the connection between public opinion and political theory with queer theory and queer studies, yes? Um, and Yossi tries to uh, find connections between dehumanization of Palestinians and gender orientation. And Yossi is going to mostly be answering questions, right? Yeah, so. This is um, what they've done together. <laughs> so before I begin, I'll leave something uh, as a background. Um, one second. This. And yeah, um, the paper is, uh, is, uh, is based on experiences that Yossi and I shared and continue sharing a couple of years ago and now. We've been writing about this issue quite a lot in Hebrew. And this paper is something that uh, happened um, we did together. And I'm going to present. And Yossi is here to help me answer your questions. So. Um, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a political movement in possession of a notable privilege must be in want of its preservation. Indeed, many times political movements tend to reproduce the very same oppression that they are seemly, seemingly fighting to abolish. However, we would prefer to name what has happened with the Sheikh Jarrah solidarity movement 
as collaboration with the Zionist settler colonialism rather than a reproduction of it. Thus, our intention here is to highlight certain themes and motives of hereby presented radical and subvertive practices of resistance that are actually no more than another embodiment of, Jew of the Jewish privilege in the context of Zionist settler colonialism, and more particularly, an embodiment of Ashkenazi male, cisgender, militant, and academic privilege. Drawing from Gloria and Zaldua's powerful words, imagery, and intellect, would like to relate to Jerusalem al-Quds as a borderland, La Frontera, especially after the 67 war, and more particularly ever since the construction of the separation wall in the past 10 years has been going on. In her book, Borderlands, La Frontera, and the New Mestizas, I hope I pronounce it correct, I'm not really good with Spanish, um, and Zaldua calls to, challenge, to change the, epistem the epistemology of borders, by shifting the focus of interest regarding them from the borderline to the land that is close to the border and to the personal and political reality of its inhabitants. According to Anzaldua, the borderland is a third country, a hybrid space that does not fall into the binaries of here and there, as well as us and them from any point of view. Observing Jerusalem through Anzaldua's lens, we would find many borderlines that create a wide and rich with suffering borderland. There are the green line and the red line that indicate the border after the 67 war. There is the separation wall that indicates the border Israel wishes to create by expelling as many Palestinians as possible from their homes next to it. There is the wall of the old city, random and casual checkpoints of the police in various parts of the city, and in addition to all of this, one can find in Jerusalem all the possible boundaries of culture, race, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, etc. Thus, while the occurrences during the 48th war ethnically cleansed what is now called East Jerusalem as well as West Jerusalem and distributed the areas respectively to Jordan and Jerusalem, during the 67 war, the Palestinian Jerusalem, as well as the villages around it, were occupied by the IDF and reunified under a Zionist authority. Ever since, Jewish neighborhoods have been built, up, built deep in the Palestinian area. From neighborhoods like the French Hill, uh, I hope you see something on the map. I hope it's like clear enough. Um, from neighborhoods like the French Hill and Givata Miftar, for the academic Bohemian bourgeoisie between the university and, and the Jewish city center, to neighborhoods and suburbs like Pisgat Ze'ev, Ma'ala Adumim, and Gilo, which were built uh, for the new immigrants who arrived in the 90s from the former USSR. On the 67 border, one would find poor ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods like Geula, and then the Musrara neighborhood that was once mostly inhabited by Jews from Arab countries, and now was and was where the Israeli Black Panthers movement formed and struggled until art students started moving in, organizing art festivals, and selling milkshakes named after the Black Panthers leaders. <laughs> True story. Um, <laughs> and in the midst of all these entirety, one can find the Palestinian neighborhood Sheikh Jarrah just on the 67 borderline. Since the ongoing Nakba of the Palestinian people <laughs> is now being carried out more by bureaucratic and legal means, and a little less by actual and physical violence, the Israeli Supreme Court has ruled in favor of evicting a number of Palestinian families from their homes and declared the land as Jewish property. Um, it all happened um, about six, seven years ago, and the struggle I'm going to talk about has started about uh, four years ago, okay? Um, at this point, just as in, any, in many other cases, the neighborhood began to be attended not only by the army, the police, and Jewish settlers, but also by Israeli peace activists who came there to resist the Zionist occupation. This time, and in this case, the neighborhood during the years of um, 2009 to 2011, the occurrences arose great interest in the Israeli public and became a platform for the largest left struggle and movement that has existed in Israel in the past years. As claims in Zaldua, well, the borderline is there to separate us from them in favor of white interests, the white can still cross the border. 
Um, on this very simple, uh, same principle, the, is the, uh, the Israeli so-called solidarity with the Palestinian inhabitants was leveraged. Not long after a number of Palestinian families were evicted from their homes, a number of Israeli activists initiated weekly marches that began in the West Jewish part of the city, crossed the 67 borderline, and ended in the demonstration that were held in the neighborhood. However, while the marches were considered to be an act of accountability that is based on neighboring relations, they emphasized once again the Jewish privilege to cross the border. Um, a word on neighboring relations. These kinds of relations are a key figure in settler colonialism and especially in, in the Zionist settler colonialism. They serve the settlers to get to know the indigenous population, get close to it, learn from it, appropriate its features, and in the end of the process, to replace it. In the case of Sheikh Jarrah, the Israeli peace activists that became subjected to extreme police violence most for the, per for the first time in their lives, as they come from a uh, highly privileged background, um, replace, replace the Palestinian people in the discourse about Zionist occupation as, um, as a prosecuted group by centering the discourse in their writing and media features around their right to protest, their right of speech, and their subjection to police brutality. Exercising a discourse on democratic rights in a colonial context and on a colonized borderland washed the Jewish element that is behind the Zionist occupation. Furthermore, the arriving and expanding of the left in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood <coughs> resembles the arrival of Jewish settlers to Palestine from the beginning of the 19th century. It all begins with finding the promised land to build and be built in, as they say in Hebrew, um, the coming to this land is motivated by a deep need, a call to leave all that is known, that is to say, the Zionist habitus of one's background, and go far beyond the borders of the civilized population to a wild and dangerous place, yet exotic, with um, different rules. Thus, Leaving the known into the wild, motivated by a call of one's ethics, more and more Israeli activists started attending the demonstrations in the neighborhood. From hardcore anarchist activists to veteran founders of the Zionist Peace Now movement, got together with curious students that developed their left consciousness in this struggle. All the shades of the Israeli left were present at the struggle, however, more and more were needed, as in the case of every mass movement. At this point, sharing a great resemblance with the Zionist movement in the beginning of the past century, the type of preferable people to take part in the protest, in the protest and politically immigrate to what was called back then the new Israeli left in the making, were educated, bourgeois, elite characters, and obviously Ashkenazi. Rapidly. As more and more famous Israeli writers and international diplomats attended the demonstrations, delivering speeches on human rights and drinking fresh orange juice that the local children were selling, a few propaganda events took place at various universities um, and other places that are connected to the type of preferable activists. A few quotes from the speech of the writer Nili Lanzmann in the event that took place in the Tzavta Theater in Tel Aviv demonstrate our previous claims. Quote, only two months ago, I had no idea where Sheikh Jarrah is, but then I spontaneously went there for the first time. It was not complicated, dangerous, or sad as I expected it to be. On the contrary, I found out that it is a place where one can do a little that is actually so much. First of all, for yourself, in the, sense, in the sense of performing participation, care, and familiarity with its occurrences in the country that we are residents of. Um, blah, 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 I'll end the quote here. <laughs> um, yeah, so starting as an embodiment of privilege to cross the border, the movement has established itself as the trendiest place for seemingly conscious, conscious Israeli activists to build a new reality of coexistence that is built by co-resistance and a joint struggle against the Zionist occupation. Nevertheless, while the struggle has begun due to initiatives of a few young women, as it was becoming more popular, um, the key figures of the struggle became a number of men, all Ashkenazi, all former officers in the IDF, doing a PhD in foreign universities. <laughs> After a while, the, there were about uh, four or five of them, yeah? 
Um, after a while, they proclaimed themselves as a leadership, and while spending all their time in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, in the lobby of the American Colony Hotel, giving interviews to foreign media and almost never visiting the families, they decided to close the meetings of the Israeli activists to a group of about 20 people whom they favored. To summarize, there is this game that people in the left like to, to play. Uh, it's called, Who is a Collaborator with the Secret Services? We have no idea if these people are collaborators in the official sense of it. However, we are sure that even if they are not, they could have done the very same work and get paid lots of money. <laughs> meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, since then, the Palestinian residents of the hood have lost trust in them and in the idea of a joint struggle as it has taken place, plans on, place on their land. Um, those key leaders of what was Sheikh Jarrah Solidarity Movement stand now in the head of Molad, the center of renewal to Israeli democracy, continuing there their academic and political work of hiding the dark side of Israel by talking about democratic values, all the while belonging to a socioeconomic group that is the first and foremost to enjoy Israeli democracy to the greatest extent. Actually, there is not much difference, if at all, between the socioeconomic and symbolic status of the leaders of that movement to its, pra to its practices um, of the mainstream Zionist state apparatus leadership and the means that it takes in order to reinforce the, the Zionist occupation. Our time is short. Uh, we don't have the opportunity to share our personal experiences and the process that we went through uh, while realizing how fatal and destructive was our presence in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood and in other contexts, contexts of so-called joint struggle. However, if you feel like asking us about it, feel free to do it. Um, and thus we'll summarize by saying that most of the Israeli left is an integral part of the Zionist settler colonialism. While the official forces of the occupation, like the Israeli court, the police, the army, deprive one from her land, home, culture, etc., then come the peaceful activists and deprive one from her voice, from her struggle, from hope. They do it in a sense that the Israeli official institutions will never be able to do. That is to say, the political settler colonialism reality is being shaped by the left through the dimension of pers personal relations. That is collaboration at its best. And we can only hope to be conscious of it, learn as fast as possible to take a step back, know our place and pe let people lead their struggle. That's it. Our final talk will be from Andrew Shield, who's a graduate student here at CUNY um, in history. And Andrew studies uh, histories of European imperialism, secularization, tourism, immigration, feminism, and sexuality. He received a BA from Brown University in international relations with Arabic, and has also studied at the University of Amsterdam. Since the beginning of the Graduate Center, he's conducted research in the Netherlands, Denmark, and Morocco. Hi. Thank you all for uh, coming. Um, so, 3% uh, of the gay men who posted uh, personal ads in, the, uh, in a popular Dutch periodical in the 60s and 70s were uh, people of color, and 6% of uh, gay men who were posting uh, personal ads looking for some form of relationship with somebody else were specifically seeking uh, a man of color. Um, so 3% and 6% are not high uh, numbers, but I find them significant. Uh, first, and f first, they are certainly not figures that you would get if you're reading about the history of the gay movement in the <coughs> Netherlands. And second and foremost, they're s certainly not statistics that you get when you're reading about the history of immigration into the Netherlands. Um, and so, uh, as one of the few historians at this conference, I'm going to talk about how uh, you can, we can use um, uh, to, to try to bring nuance to the histories of immigration and the history of the gay movement in the Netherlands to uh, add to current debates about homo nationalism in the Netherlands today. So, first and foremost, why Netherlands? Because many of you might that. Well, uh, in, in terrorist assemblages, uh, Jasper Puar, in theorizing about what pro-gay, anti-immigrant politics might look like, actually focuses on the Netherlands in uh, part, 
to, uh, as exemplary of this type of politics. And similarly, Sarah Schulman in Theorizing Pinkwashing also looks to the Netherlands as exemplary for an, um, pro-gay, anti-Arab um, politics. So how did this appear in the Netherlands? Well, uh, briefly, uh, what they're pointing to is a certain strain of politics that started in the late 1990s, uh, exemplified by uh, Pim for Town, but popular in the last decade through uh, various groups, and hard to identify as either right-wing or left-wing, by certainly by United States standards. And Pim for Town was a flamboyant gay man who uh, entered into the common debate in Europe uh, about the supposed clash of civilizations that was not happening just among states, but also happening within states. And the supposed clash of civilizations was between uh, immigrants and native Dutch. And as a gay man, he entered into the debate saying uh, pretty uh, oftentimes very outrageous things that made great sound bites, like saying that he had he was allowed to call um, Moroccans backward because he had slept with them and um, that type of argument. And this, uh, this really um, caught on with a certain strain. Uh, it certainly uh, it didn't take everybody in the Netherlands, but um, uh, it became popular and the shadows of Pim Fortown, who was assassinated by an environmentalist in the Netherlands, uh, the shadows of his legacy lived on throughout the next uh, 10 years and can certainly still be seen uh, today um, in the party of Seychert Wilders and other populist parties that get um, a lot of votes, an embarrassing number. It was the third large, Geert Wilders party got the third number of uh, votes in the parliament in the 2008 uh, elections. Um, okay, so uh, the history, briefly the history of the gay movement in the Netherlands and the history of immigration in the Netherlands. These are the two histories that I'm hoping to add nuance to because they rarely overlap. Uh, so the history of um, the gay movement basically goes, both go back to say the post-war era. Um, the Netherlands boasts in having the longest uh, continuously running gay organization, the COC, which if you're unfamiliar, it's not a reference to male genitalia, but it's, uh, it was a covert name center for culture and recreation that um, was a covert name for the gay organizations, the same organization that exists um, today. And um, uh, the COC is certainly not the only uh, queer group in the Netherlands today or going back to say the 50s, 60s. There were many other groups, especially um, uh, ones related to say sexual emancipation in general, to feminism in general, and various um, other groups. Uh, but in the 60s, these groups became uh, more radicalized and achieved, say, in 1971, one of their big achievements was uh, putting uh, legal parity between homosexual and heterosexual age of consent laws. It used to be that homos was just a 21-plus club. Uh, and so that was a big achievement in 1971, and also through the 70s, uh, integrating gays into the military, which is something uh, which was relatively early. In the 80s, for example, the group was successful at training uh, police uh, in sensitivity toward gay uh, issues. If, for example, even teaching about the prevalence of cruising and sex in parks and how that's something that the police don't necessarily need to prosecute for. Uh, so the Netherlands has a unique history uh, in, in regards to uh, gay rights that certainly from an American United States point of view um, uh, is interesting. Uh, as far as, um, and, just, uh, and, and then also in 2001 they were the first country to have gay marriage. Uh, we'll probably all have some ambivalent about that topic, but that is certainly um, uh, a watershed moment. Um, as far as the history of immigration into the Netherlands, going also back to uh, the post immediate post-war era, the first wave were post-colonial immigrants from uh, Indonesia, and later on wave, waves of post-colonial immigrants came from uh, the Antilles and Suriname. And um, actually, right before Surinamese independence, a, a third to one half of all of Suriname migrates into the Netherlands. Um, these groups are uh, often arrived with Dutch citizenship, with Dutch language abilities, and the uh, ability to go to an uh, university, for example. Uh, so that are markedly different from the other major group from the 60s and 70s, the so-called guest workers. 
The guest worker, similar to if you know the history in Germany, Switzerland, is that the, the Dutch state had a bilateral, bilateral agreements, first with Southern European and then later with North African um, states to recruit guest workers uh, into various industries that were booming uh, and needed workers, whether it was mining or healthcare or a variety of fields. So bilateral agreements with, say, Morocco came in 1969. All of them ended in 73. Um, but the people that were most likely to stay were those from, say, Morocco or Turkey, because if you were from Italy through the EEC, it was easier to travel back and forth. If you're from Morocco and you left after 73, you weren't going to be able to come back. So the Netherlands puts in policies to get families to reunify, and um, uh, then we have more families. So this, this groups of people, uh, predominantly for, I focus on, say, Moroccan groups and also Turkish groups, um, are later in the integration process where, uh, as far as language and citizenship, uh, often policies didn't start addressing their specific needs until the 80s or even 90s. And then finally, the other wave of immigrants would be um, asylum immigrants, from, especially from former Yugoslavia, but also Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia. Um, so it's a very diverse group is what I'm trying to get at here. But of course, in the 1990s, they become a more monolithic group, and specifically among them, people of uh, Muslim background or coming from Muslim majority countries, regardless of how they identify, um, are demonized as a monolithic group. And that is specifically the group that Pim Fortown and others were uh, pitting as the other to the Dutch enlightened uh, pro-gay rights, pro-women's uh, rights group. And we're all familiar with this type of politics. Um, so we're going back to my statistics about gay uh, immigrants, where I'm trying to uh, work in my history fits along with the um, queer uh, of color critiques uh, proposed by, for example, Fatima al Tayeb and uh, Suhraya uh, Jivraj, who specifically talking about the Dutch context, say, what about um, queer Muslims? Uh, where do they fit into this debate? When a lot of Dutch scholars have uh, put together very, uh, and if you're curious, I can give you names later, have, later have, have really intervened in positive ways. But one of the trends is often, well, both sides can learn from each other. And so uh, Al Tayeb or Jivraj is saying, what do you mean by both sides? Gays and Muslims are two different sides. Uh, and that's probably where this topic would fit into the impossible communities of, you know, who are these uh, gays who cannot properly be gay, to quote the title of uh, one of L Type's um, articles. Uh, so returning then to my statistics of some of these examples, and I'll just say a couple really quickly. Of uh, you know, in 1967, an Indonesian young man from the southeast Netherlands, so not even one of the major cities, is posting looking for a friend. Uh, in 1977, a Moroccan writing in Dutch says, "Moroccan, 22 years old, hobbies are football, music, swimming, um, looking for correspondence uh, and friendship." Uh, my languages are Spanish, French, and Arabic. So he must have gotten helped writing that in Dutch because it was written in Dutch. Um, so that's an example of just some of the posts from people who identify as an immigrant or as a person of color. Uh, those specifically seeking, some are uh, more broad language, uh, saying things like skin color not important, color is no objection, uh, white or brown. Others are more specific, saying Surinamese are welcome. Uh, one says specifically Moroccan, Spanish, Turkish, or black are welcome. Uh, and so um, that's just an example of the 6% of people who were specifically looking. Uh, you might notice in my initial statistics, I said 3% of the men looking for men and 6% of the men looking for men. Uh, why not the women? About 20% of the posts were indeed from women. And uh, I had not found any of the 500 that I've categorized right now that had uh, were women who either identified ra with their race or um, or ethnicity, or who talked about looking for race or ethnicity, which until this morning, I continue to go. So at 7 a.m. this morning, I found a Surinamese woman um, who was looking for friendship in, uh, so that will change some of my statistics. Now, but that woman was writing actually from Suriname. So that was actually a category I didn't include uh, those who are writing internationally from abroad were about 10% of the posts. 
Uh, so some of those ones were also interesting. The Surinamese lesbian, for example, uh, an Indonesian man looking for correspondence uh, in 1972. Right when uh, most when I said half of Suriname is leaving for the Netherlands, a young man in uh, Paramaribo, the capital, wants correspondence with young men in the Netherlands. Uh, so perhaps aiding with his pathway when he eventually or considers this migration. Uh, I even found uh, two guys who wrote in simple Dutch from Singapore uh, requesting please write in English back, but they give their names and addresses, Lawrence Yim and Stuart Young on Chin Chu Strat, um, Street. Uh, people also were writing from <coughs> Eastern Europe, which is interesting, uh, the East Germany, Poland, also South Africa and around the world. Uh, also, a, a, a small category that I didn't include in this uh, were people who were writing looking for housing or employment or offering housing or employment. But these categories are also interesting if we're going to think about how people were using gay set, uh, networks in order to uh, foster paths towards immigration and integration. Uh, two examples of uh, where these might overlap was uh, a guy who was seeking, he writes, quote, uh, homo boy, 22, not Dutch, whatever that meant, and this is all in Dutch, uh, he seeks three things. One, to move to Amsterdam. Two, a job in tourism or uh, public relations. And three, a physical and spiritual connection with a clean cut man. Um, so here we get somebody who's using these gay, per gay social networks and gay personal ads, not only to tr as a way of trying to in adapt into an urban culture, but also uh, for a relationship too and uh, a job. So we're seeing how these are all overlapping. Uh, he ideally probably would like free housing, right? So that brings it to the topic of those who are offering housing. Many of these are just very boring, what you might see on Craigslist today. Here's my house. This is what I'm offering you. Um, you know, just a normal posting. But some of them were offering, say, um, uh, their houses without pay, and that would certainly be uh, enticing to a recent immigrant or to, uh, if we're also considering internal migration, which I'm less interested in. Um, and these often overlap the economic and this personal. For example, a lesbian who owned a cafe and snack bar writes um, that she wants somebody to work with me and to build a future together. So again, you know, overlapping the uh, personal and the um, economic professional life. Uh, a man with a, uh, a farmhouse in a small town offered somebody to come live with him, saying race is not important. And another uh, living in Scheveningen, which is a beach town, offers free living to, quote, some, a darker young man, whatever that might mean. Um, so there are many complications that I won't be able to get into today about, well, what about exotification? What about power dynamics here? Uh, one of the other things that I would love to get into is that not one person in 500 ads identifies as white. And I think that that is probably ch changed with white populations in the Netherlands and urban areas today. Uh, and so for those interested in critical white studies, that is something that you could look into. Also, nobody says the word monogamous until um, the 80s. Uh, not one person. Um, so I'm not going to really draw any real conclusions, but just end with three questions related to theories of queer uh, migration, which is, so what role does sexuality play in the decision making to leave? and um, what role do these gay social networks perhaps uh, play in assisting with modes of immigration and paths toward uh, integration? And finally, how can more nuanced histories of, of the gay movement and histories of immigration help uh, when in, ter in current debates today about homonationalism? Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, all of you. Um, each one of you raises a whole set of issues and questions on your own that I think are really rich, and you all sort of ended in a place of, pick, please pick this up. There's so much more to unpack there. Um, so I'm going to open this up to both the panel, if you have questions for each other, and everyone for your questions. Um, and I just want to sort of notice first a thread that I see um, kind of through most of your papers and that I think is maybe worth picking up and thinking about, which is um, uh, all of you have sort of paid attention to or at this sort of crucial moment um, of theorizing um, and activism at, um, around homonationalism and pinkwashing, and a, at a sort of like intensification of the theorizing of things that have been sort of certainly terms that activists have been contending.
various ways. And I think it's really interesting the way all of you are, are sort of um, reaching for and trying to find and theorize what is missing. Um, and, and how the, the sort of language that we have available to us now might collude with at the same time as resist the way that um, the way that both pinkwashing and homonationalism separately and relatedly work. Um, so I hope we can kind of pick up that question. Um, but I'll also open that up to you and to you and to you and the wonderful pink scarf. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you. It was a fabulous panel. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> And I wanted to pick on some of the, I see there's sort of a, um, a dissonance between uh, some of the different frameworks offered by, by the different presenters. Um, and I, um, I was kind of, um, uh, so this is a question for, for, um, for Karma. I, I, was, I was kind of struck um, in sort of your, your critique of Puar's notion of, of the assemblage. Um, and, and the relationship between assemblage and yeah. assemblage versus intersectionality. Um, I might, I might be misreading this, but at some point it, it seems to me like um, you were discounting assemblage in terms of um, abstracted affect, which I, I don't, I don't see the correlation between abstracted affect and, and assemblage. But maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something there. Um, but I was also a little wary of um, precisely some of the points that have been that have been brought up of, of the of around the, like why um, how pinkwashing and homo nationalism off of this notion of intersectionality. Um, I think that's something that, um, one thing that at least the, least the way that I see intersectionality is, is it presumes um, identity categorizations as a priori um, and as, as transhistorical um, in a way that, that can also be very US-centric. Um, even, 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 even when talking about you know, people in the diaspora within the US, it's still um, it's in a way that's US-centric and, and you know, stabilizing categories of, of Race, class, gender, etc., as you know, outside of history, and it's kind of the matrix. Um, and I think that that um, doesn't take into account specifically some of the critiques that are made by what PQPDS about, um, and and and, and Jasper Pora's reading of, of PQPDS is, 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 is you know, a refusal of this incitement to discourse, um, particularly around you know ontologies of, of gender and sexuality. Um, and I think that that's. That's something that I'm very wary of um, in terms of where that fits in with, um, with you know, so, you know, I think that's a, an imperial potential within, within the notion of, of intersectionality that I think is part of why there is this turn to be language. Yeah, I mean, I think we probably read intersectionality very differently. It sounds, but. Um, I mean, we're not. I'm, I don't think we're trying to dismiss the assemblage. I mean, we try to say that we don't see turning to the assemblage as a problem. The question is um, the negation of intersectionality. Uh, and again, I think there are critiques to be made of intersectionality. Um, I don't think intersectionality assumes um, identity categories as a priori. Um, I just don't see a lot of evidence of that. I think it's based on readings that are different than how I read it um, across time and space. Um, a lot of theories are, you know, start in the US and are taken up elsewhere and, you know, that's the nature of theory. So, um, you know, that's part of why we're bringing this up. I think, like, this has been something that in a lot of circles that has been very difficult to talk about. Um, and I think it is worth expanding and that's, you know, part of our polemic form. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, we would probably just disagree, it sounds like, on our reading of intersectionality, which uh, doesn't necessarily, um, which is potentially productive, but um, yeah, I guess that's how I respond to that. I'm not sure what else to say. I, have a, I also wanted to thank you all. I thought the panel was incredible. And this question is for the first speaker. Sorry, I don't remember your name. Maya. Maya. Okay. Um, so, uh, I really like your idea that um, that there is no kind of presupposed identity that you have to align with in order to take out any sort of cause, such as Jewish or Palestinian in this case. Um, but I'm wondering where that line becomes blurry in terms of folks not having any ties to a land or to a people and taking up an issue um, like, you know, you know, one thing that you brought up was that some folks were invested in making queers more visible in, in Palestine. And so I'm, I guess my question is, where is that line become blurry between anyone can take up a human rights issue to 
you know, we know, you know, how to best handle the situation in this place that we have no direct relationship to. Um, I think that's a, a solidarity question. I mean, you know, it's like there are many questions about how to do solidarity. Um, so there are two things. One is that in, in all of the discussion that in the interviews about people's work in South Africa and Central America, nobody was saying like it didn't matter what people in South Africa or Central America were doing. It, the point was that there was communication outward, and like you know there was a sort of clear set of understandings of what the human rights issues were, and then people could act on them. That doesn't mean that people who are acting on them can do anything they want, and it, and that it's not bad for like the movements that are coming from inside. But it does mean. That um, that people are people are free to take up support for those movements, regardless of whether or not they have some kind of ethnic or whatever stake. Their stake is a human stake. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I forgot what I was going to say about the second thing. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, the, I I thought that one of the um, like there is an issue. So that this question about Hamas, that I didn't really talk about, sort of brought up this issue that like you know Hamas is a Palestinian thing, right? It exists. And then there are all these activists outside who are not Palestinian and not, are not part of the thing. So like there's, you know, people are really reluctant to take up a judgment, even though, you know, if you looked at it purely like, you know, if you look at it out of context, you might say like, well, I don't support this or I don't support that. You know, people said lots of those things, like I don't support theocracy, you know, or I, I do or I don't support violent resistance, whatever. But it's really hard to, because we have this sort of commitment to solidarity, it's hard to, um, it's hard from the outside to say what's right or wrong. Um, but with the advent of um, a sort of a, like a specifically queer voice coming out of Palestine, that also like in the same way that queer voices here sort of connote human rights, rightly or wrongly, but you know queer voices coming out of Palestine like give a um, like offer queers elsewhere a way to distinguish between um, between one set of ideas coming out of Palestine and another. You know, there's a lot of conflict in Palestine. You know, there's like political conflict and social conflict and all this stuff that would um, be playing out differently if Palestinians were allowed to have an active civil society. In the absence of that, for people who are outside trying to do solidarity without um, like claiming ownership of the issue, it seems really possible to do for the for the um, like the information that's coming from queer Palestinian formations to be the basis for a sort of pure human rights activism outside that doesn't require us to say like why we're doing it. Can I ask a actually corollary question, um, Amea, about that, which is um, I'm really interested in the for better or for worse tag that came after the human rights framework. And I'm curious about in the in the interviews and in the conversations we've had. Um, so if there's a sort of, um, correct me if I'm understanding your argument wrong, but um, if there's a queer political identification that works both in Palestine and in the US, or it works in the US in terms of like understanding uh, what solidarity looks like and sort of hearing messages from Palestine that that can work outside of the sort of ownership paradigm of solidarity and the sort of insider outsiderness of it. If that opens out onto a onto I think we just call like a pure human rights framework. Um, I'm curious about what you have seen so far, or what your how you're understanding so far, the the limits of that. Like, in what way is that problematic? In what way? I mean, because human, you know, there's a lot of critique of human rights discourse as um, as sort of universalizing, as flattening, as also like forbidding the possibility of um, thinking about community and resistance, of thinking about collectivity, and also thinking about state violence as organized by the state and as sort of not sort of not beyond um, various kinds of formations of collectivity. Is that, well, is that am I understanding you right? Does that question make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Um, I guess like we have. I guess like partly I sort of feel free to um, to make this to, like claim that we can do human rights active. Like we can sort of filter out the identity stuff and do human rights activism because. Partly because, like, I feel comfortable that the framework that's been established by Palestinian queer organizing has so clearly like set up the set up the um, forces against that. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, if the call from PQBDS is anybody who wants to support queer rights or any rights should end the occupation, and like we can't separate those things out, then those of us elsewhere who are doing human rights solidarity work like have that call to build around. So, like, that work has been done nicely and 
I appreciate that, and it frees us up to do other stuff. I don't know if there's more to say about that. I mean, I guess the, the only other thing that I would say is that uh, I don't think that the framework that we have now, where we're all, where you know, we're doing this sort of identity-based, like, well, I'm a Jew and I support, you know, Palestinian human rights, therefore it's more legitimate, is any better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually want to ask you about the human rights framework. I mean, how, how do you salvage that when it's deployed everywhere as justification for war and, and et cetera? I mean, I just, I just think it's been take, taken and, and, and took flight. And so, like, to make sense, to speak outside ourselves, you know, the organizers kind of thing, within that framework seems to me very difficult and and perhaps feeds, you know, does it reproduce the way in which the powers that be now within the existing framework have glued on to human rights as in fact an extension of a neoliberal globalization? Maybe it does. Oh, uh, and okay. I mean like I don't I wouldn't argue I mean I feel like this is a conversation that we need to have. You know, like okay. I you know we spent a long time in a different um, you know we spent a long time in the identity world and and I it seems urgent that we break out of it, partly because oh. of the thing that I was saying that came out of the revisions conversations and probably other people have been thinking about for a long time, that because of the sort of intensive participation of Jews in the anti-occupation movement, it's also very white. You know, so like, if we wanna try and shift that, maybe we can, you know, like stop making it about Jews, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then I, the other thing, the other sort of, you know, hopeful answer that I would have about that is that, you know, like not in a universal sense, but in a sort of, I don't know. Queers do it better. Queers like queers at least have the critique of the thing that you're talking about. I mean, maybe we, maybe we're losing it. Like maybe institutions don't have that. But like, if it's bad, or if there are problems with it, we ought to be able to use queerness as a lever to try and do it better. I would say. I'm curious when you think of um, like kind of hearing your thoughts on what happened, like how you see kind of the use of like white bodies. Like queer and non queer um, in Palestine and mm -hmm. like in activism and the use of, uh, in terms of like, if I say hustle and stuff, because I've been trying to think about, you know, the kind of power we ascribe to white bodies and sort of instrumental, maybe momentary power that bodies can have. Mm -hmm. Whether, yeah, and I don't know if you have any thoughts kind of reflecting on your okay. own experiences. Um, how do we move forward? Like, how do we use, if that power obviously is good in the long term, how do we, like, what do we do in the short term, I guess? Okay, um, okay. Um, I, I will try to answer if, if like uh, I don't relate like everything that you asked, so please uh, do it once again. But um, what, I, I'll start like with this struggle specifically. Actually, um, the people who started it were like uh, queer activist people. Um, really fast, um, the families, like the Palestinian families, had like issues with uh, their performativity in some cases. Uh, many times they didn't like, um, I don't know, but the, the point is that like uh, these, these relations were like never resolved because all these uh, Ashkenazi militant males arrived and took over. Uh, same thing happened um, in relation to like uh, feminine identity and uh, women who started the struggle uh, with this queer group and were like really marginalized. Um, so, um, I don't know. I think that things um, just happen in um, in a more like um, in a more personal way, I guess, uh, than organizing or whatever. Because no matter what how you organize, there will be like uh, somebody who organizes better and has like uh, the more like. Um, nice identity in the mainstream's eyes and that that's what happened i guess so um and the money yeah money obviously like cultural capital or real capital yeah so um i i don't know um 
can I answer any better? Yeah, I guess, I don't know, I guess even if you look at like something like Rachel Corey, you know, someone, mm -hmm. like who's obviously someone who should be celebrated, but still there's those tensions and sort of, I'm sure, anxieties a lot of us have around whose bodies we celebrate and who gets memorialized and who's held up as like a human rights hero, kind of like what we were talking about mm -hmm. before. I don't know if anybody else wants yeah, I think it's like, um, I, I, I don't know, um, I don't think that everything is grounded in the body, but uh, certain bodies behave in a very uh, certain way, which correlates the, their status in society. And like, that, that's, that's the problem, I guess. Uh, then my question, uh, in terms of the sort of Colonial sexual relations and the erotics of colonialism is problematic as they may be. I, I fear that there may be a false binary between Dutch, non Dutch, white, non white. And I'm wondering, and I'm sure in your larger project, when you have more than 15 minutes, you can do this. But if you could just briefly kind of unpack how these affective histories are different, whether you're talking about the relationship with Indonesians versus Surinamese versus. Uh, Moroccan um, and Turkish and so forth. If you could just maybe give us a couple of takeaways about some of the key differences. Yeah, well, as I said, one of the biggest differences is the post colonial migrants often came with uh, language abilities and citizenship. Um, but an another thing that I find remarkable is that um, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, which many of us know. Uh, but uh, when problematizing the Muslim uh, immigrants, uh, Indonesians are rarely included in this category, and it's often looking more at the um, Moroccans and Turkish who came as guest workers, in addition to those who came via asylum in the 90s. Um, and so that's certainly one of the yeah larger... And so I actually have focused in general more on the Moroccan populations and their specific history and guest worker history in general, and less so on the Indonesians and Surinamese who indeed did come up more in these ads. Um, when I inevitably go into um, collecting oral histories in the next year, I hope to find more nuances about the, um, um, the immigrant group that certainly was not a coherent unit. Um, but um, uh, there continue to, I find in various other sources, this isn't quite answering, but um, uh, I mean, I only talked about the gay personal ads, but if you look at, say, the rest of the magazine, reading it for the articles, um, you do find additional interesting things uh, for both the uh, post-colonial and the guest worker group. So I found an in uh, interview with a Moroccan man who came to Amsterdam in the 70s, quote, to be free and because of his gay identity. And that was um, certainly unusual compared to the type of organization among, say, uh, Surinamese um, Mati, the uh, lesbian group, have much more, uh, more cohesiveness and um, uh, well, in part because of the Dutch language ability and just that there seems to be, for the post-colonial migrants, a much more um, solid base. <coughs> Thank you. Um, the assertion you made that intersectionality doesn't presuppose identity categories. I was wondering if you could flesh that out a bit, because I can see some dimensions in which that becomes problematic. Um, for instance, like in the very word people of color, we use that, you know, when you say one is a person of color, you're using, you know, you're defined, that gets used when you're defining people in a context where they're identity and split supremacist, which has had globalizing impact, sure, but there are certainly contexts that are more racially homogenous than others. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes, you know, it's, you know, when you have diaspora folks who move in transition either for labor, uh, for labor reasons, or because they have class and capital to do so, and they become racialized, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a transformation. It wasn't a priori, it wasn't given. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, in South Asian context, we can have skin component discrimination. It's not the same thing as Racism in uh, racism in the United States, mm -hmm. um, or you know, 
and some of the people I organize with now uh, speak from coming from a racially homogenous society like South Korea. Um, and they come to the United States, you know, and find out that there is this thing called white. It is privileged and they don't have it, and all of a sudden they're racialized. Mm -hmm. You know, how does intersectionality serve them automatically in a sense? You know, it seems like it, it, it would be a framework that would be useful for them, for them, you know, for it to, for them to utilize it at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess the way or the utility that I see in intersectionality, and again, I, I'm not trying to say there's no, like, that's this perfect framework that we shouldn't critique. Um, I just think it, I think it gets too easily dismissed, and I think it's kind of become the whipping boy um, when, when so there's a lot of this discussion of post-intersectionality, and I'm like, we haven't even achieved where most people even understand intersectionality. Like, So I guess I would say, um, with regard to that, for me, what intersectionality highlights is processes of subject, subjection and processes of power. Mm -hmm. And so how is it that racializing processes intersect or interact or interlock or intermesh? I mean, there's a lot of ways we could talk about this where intersection may not even be the right word. Um, but how is it that these processes interact to produce um, partic particular kinds of possibilities um, and impossibilities? And so, um, for me, that's how I've always read intersectionality, not that race, class, gender, sexuality do this, um, but that institutions or the state or in representation or whatever sort of these kinds of, uh, and I think it's mostly at the institutional level where we see this. And I do think that's why I'm not saying that we shouldn't put intersectionality assemblage in conversation mm -hmm. with each other. I think we actually really should. Mm -hmm. I just think we shouldn't. I see this negation of intersectionality as problematic because I really do think it highlights things that are very, very real to people's lives about how power works and about how um, subjection happens. So I guess I would say that's how I've always read intersectionality, not as um, an identity politic, I guess. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Um, and it's not a universalizing... It's not a universal framework, right? I mean, of course, uh, the, the, the production of racialized... Um, relationships and subjectivities and identities um, differ vastly across context. Um, and there are things that intersectionality can't highlight and can't help us understand. But I think there are things that it can um, that are still very important in people's like everyday lives. So I guess that's how I'd answer that. Quite connected to that question, I also uh, wondering if you could talk more about. I mean, the, the thing that I've seen a lot in terms of um, when intersectionality gets used or not gets used is in terms of its academic sexiness. Um, uh, like a similar analogy I could probably use is critical race theory kind of gets criticized the same way because it's much more sexier to be post-colonial or post-structural because then you can like play around with a lot of. Um, you know, have words, whereas critical race theory is quite Marxist and, you know, quite black-centered. And so I see, like, people, I mean, I'm not saying that all critics are those, because I think there are quite a few legitimate critics, but I also see that people, you know, like, jumping on to the um, hottest bandwagon. Um, and I think that's got something to do with the way that uh, intersectionality, I think people have been quite easy, I mean, easily dismissed it um, in certain ways. So do you see that happening as well? Because I, I mean, you did bring up the um, kind of like very abstract theorizing about intersectionality, uh, which really doesn't take people anywhere. Yeah, I mean, I think this is always the case, right? I mean, I think like when we're talking about, I mean, for me, like, I, I, I orient to theory as activist and academic simultaneously. And so um, I think there's always that kind of risk. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily what the critiques of intersectionality, all of them are. And um, I mean, and I, and, and I don't think they're all invalid. I mean, I think there really are things that we need to be pushing on. But I do think there is a way in which intersectionality has become conveniently reduced to a certain kind of essentialist identity politics, which I think is implicitly kind of racist. And um, I, I think there's a, a problem with that. And um, I know that might be controversial to say, but I do 
I do feel that way, and I and I have seen it come up, and it's and a lot of it's been in these conference settings when I've had these kinds of conversations, and um, I actually think that's okay too. Like I think that sort of tension is very productive, um, but yeah, that might be part of a dynamic. directed towards you, yeah. and it's really just, I don't know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around around rage. Um, <clears throat> so, from what I understood you were talking about, is, is it, there's kind of a, um, a normalized, or, yeah, normalized management and distribution of, of who's allowed to be angry, who's allowed to be outraged, and who's not allowed to be outraged. Am I right? Is that... That could be one point. <laughs> I try to present many aspects to why I think rage does not work in Israel as, as a tool to fight like different oppressions. But that's like one one aspect. Uh, I mean, so enrage can co can cover like this like a, a violent expression of rage, but it's also come out in, in smaller smaller ways. Do you think that there's that we can the small acts of rage, the small expressions of rage, and, and even small acts of rage that defy the ways that I'm told it, I can and cannot be angry. Do you think that there is, I guess, value in those in, in spite of being within within that power system? Um, I think from what I see, uh, in Israel it does not work. I actually saw very good use of rage in the States even, but Maybe people who live in New York can understand that better. Israel is a very enraged place. People are always angry. And like rage really like functions as like everyday tool of like just like communicating, getting things done. Um, and it's actually very similar to the feeling of walking the streets of New York. <laughs> yes. Um, and, but maybe you have like this imbalance of like different Americans, like more polite ways. But in Israel, it's just like blunt and angry. And so I think being rage is often used to avoid the political issue and not to like really offer a different met method to, to deal with problems. And as I see it, is it's it's just used to separate uh, different activist groups in Israel uh, rather than actually be directed at institutions and do some good. Um, and I also I, I want to like shift from maybe a little from your question just to say to uh, maybe connect myself to my panel and I I think that. If I, I, I would like to use my claims about rage uh, in towards like how do we deal with um, the problem of Israel as human rights activists in general, like outside of Israel, I think if we know that the anti-Semitic claim is a tool of dismissing the work that is being done uh, for uh, Palestine and against uh, Israeli occupation is maybe to stop using the dichotomy of Israelis and Palestinians because then you just continue the same uh, erasure of different oppressions that coexist. And as an Arab Jew, I never exist in that discussion. Like when you ask, should I like put more uh, distinction on the Palestinian voice or the Jewish voice? You assume there is like one here and one there, but there is a third voice of like uh, Jewish Arab people, and I think Jews outside of Israel are sometimes somewhat blind to their own privilege because I am totally against Israel and its government and all the forces in it. But where would I go? Like my parents came there from Morocco. It's not like I have like a passport to go somewhere else. So it's very easy to be critical as a Jew when you don't have to live in Israel. But some of us are forced to be there and we really want to go, but where would we go? It's like we think it's fucked up and we really like want to object to everything that happens in Israel. We are seriously committed to fighting the Israeli occupation. 
but we are still Israel. So when you talk about like Israel, for me, if you don't want to straighten like the people who use the anti-Semitic claim, maybe try to avoid being anti-Semitic because that's somewhat like a race like Israeli, Jewish, Arab people, and other minorities in Israel, because it's not like the only minority, uh, Mizrahi, like there are like huge refugees community in Israel right now. Nobody's like mentioning them, or there are like many different groups in Israel that are not being acknowledged, and of course, you can't compare their problems to Palestinians. Of course, I don't wanna like come out as someone who says that, but still, like, I think fighting oppression, especially with tools of like boycott, should be very careful in avoiding to promote hatred. We're different, invisible communities. And if we call this like impossible communities, I want to talk about those impossible communities. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think I'm just like one example, but Israel is not like a country of like soldiers. Uh, oppressors and Palestinian oppressed. It's much, much more complex. And as I'm like happy and ecstatic that the states really like finally took on this like issue of Israel, I feel that it's like the only way to take it on is in very like black and white terms. Like, okay, we were for Israel, let's erase that. We are now against Israel. And like some people are still stuck in the middle. So I, I really invite you all to <coughs> think of the great zones yeah. in, in this discussion. Yeah, I've got a question. I, I, I was saying back when I was here, I said I was from the But uh, I, um, this is a little confusing for me. So you're not a Zionist? No. Okay. But you love your country? No, not necessarily. Uh, but you it's the only place for you. My me. passport does well, not really give live. me where any other way. Where do you live? I live in Israel. Israel. That's where That's I was the, born. And your parents were Morocco. refugees or immigrants? Yeah, from Morocco. Right. And my family, we can't go back to Morocco. It's really not, yeah. not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> um, so your native language is free. So my mother does saying, not speak like, Hebrew, so it's your I, definition. I, 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 well, you speak, that's it. I'm going to speak, we're very right. tired. Oh, this is, this is yeah. an important yeah. question. Yeah. 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 It's, like, it's actually kind of an attack, not really yeah. a question. I'm asking or an you, question. Question. Do you Do you have a real question for yes. a genuine yes. 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 interrogation? Yes. Here's a real question. No, I'm being racist, Sean. I'm asking you, what's your ethnic identity? No. This is a, I asked a question. This is right. a, you're not asking a question. You're taking the hand. You don't understand. We'll take it. I think it exactly exactly what I was trying to say. But I'm also an Arab Jew. Okay. But this is not enough of the Zionist He's a Zionist activist. If anybody else has questions that address the substance of what our panelists have talked about, we're going to take one more, and then we'll be done. You want to ask a question? Oh, no, I've already asked one. So does anybody else? Does anyone who has asked a question want to do that? Okay, great. Then, uh, why don't you ask a question? Then? I mean, I am really interested in this idea of not like it's so easy. You're right. There's just like addiction to speaking of like I am a Jew, and therefore, I mean, there's all these problems, and I think a lot of people on the panel talked about the dangers of speaking from that position. But also, I think you know, like when I go home and have conversations with my family, and like you encounter the Jewish community in the diaspora, especially when you're talking to Jews in the diaspora, it's so difficult not to grab onto that because that's how all the Jews in the diaspora enter it. You know, because when you talk about their relationship to Israel, it's always like, oh, as a Jew, my grandparents, my parents, you know, I'm sure all of us who are Jewish know what we're talking about. So I guess, like, I mean, I, I totally see your point, which is that maybe we should just be like, I should be like, hey, dad, Palestine is a human rights issue, and it's not a Jewish issue. And maybe that's, is, is that the, the way we should approach it? <laughs> we can get a build it, but uh, you know, I think there are ways that are useful. So we're going to let all the questions that the panelists have raised that haven't yet been addressed sort of hang in the air and hope that all of you can come up with each other and with our panelists. And thank all of you for your great talks.